Hi everybody, this is Pastor John, and we're going to look now at week nine of our Bible study, Amazing Wisdom, Amazing Women. Today we're going to look at Hannah, which is one of a two-person combination, Miriam being the other person, and we'll look at her next week. But this week, let's look at Hannah. We say that Hannah is a mother of prayer. And as we talk about the story of David becoming the king of Israel, we begin that story with Samuel. And when you begin the story with Samuel, you also have to begin with Hannah. You see, in her story, we find a woman of faith given to intensive prayer who teaches us an important lesson about faithfulness and redemption, even in the midst of pain. We will find out that Hannah is the mother of Samuel and Samuel is the one who chooses David to replace Saul as the king of Israel. Hannah's story begins in the same way of Sarah and Rachel in that she cannot have any children. She lives in an area of Ephraim and she's married to a man named Elkanah. The scriptures tell us that he was actually from the tribe of Levi and had substantial means because he was able to support two wives. His other wife was named Peninnah. Now let's read from Samuel 1, verses 4 through 5 out of the New International Version. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. So what Samuel is reflecting here is that on a regular basis, everyone was to go present an offering to the temple. And when they presented that sacrifice, that offering to the temple, the temple would then give them portions of meat to take back to their families. So that's what Elkanah would do. But when he brought the meat back, he would make sure that there was enough meat for his wife, Panana, and the children that she bore, the sons and daughters. But he always gave Hannah an extra amount, a double portion, the scripture says. What we in get indicated from this is that he loved Hannah. He loved her more than Elkanah. And so even though she wasn't able to produce children, uh, she, he, he was certainly in love with her. Now let's look at 1 Samuel 1, 6 and 7 from the New International Version. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and could not eat. So not only is Hannah someone who's unable to have children, but her husband's other wife is certainly provoking her to the point that she's weeping and can't even eat. So not only does she deal with the disgrace in her culture of not being able to have a child, but she also has her husband's other wife tormenting her about her condition. In fact, Elkanah understands that because in 1 Samuel 1, 8, we read, her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you so downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? Now, what's kind of interesting is that in this particular culture, Elkanah could have put a stop to his wife's badgering of Hannah, but the scriptures don't suggest that he does that. Instead, he just wants to continue to comfort Hannah in her time of distress. Now let's move on to 1 Samuel 1, 10 through 11. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, 
but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all of his days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. So we get from this text that Hannah goes to pray, and she goes to pray in the temple. Now, in the temple at that time, there's a guy by the name of Eli. And Eli is one of the chief priests of the temple, and he's watching Hannah, and he notices that she's praying, but as was the custom and tradition in those days when you prayed, you prayed out loud. She was moving her lips as if to speak, but no words were coming out because she was praying from her heart. And he approaches her and thinks that she may be drunk. So Hannah's just being attacked from all different directions. Her husband's other wife is constantly attacking her. She's not able to have any children, which meant society was attacking her. She goes to the temple to offer a very deep internal prayer, and the priest of the temple thinks that she's nothing but drunk. Hannah is not going to be told what she is and she is not. So in 15 and 16, we read, Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying out here out of my great anguish and grief. So she responds to Eli's rather curse comment. And Eli is this chief priest, this high priest in the temple at Shiloh. Now we also find out that Eli has his own family and he has two sons, but these two sons turn out to be very abusive in their behavior. What that really does is it sets the stage and opens the door for, the, for what happens next when God does listen to Hannah, and Hannah has a son, which she then offers to Eli to take care of him. Well, when Hannah responds back to Eli's rather strong comment about being drunk, Eli responds with this, it's a blessing. May the God of Israel grant you, you, grant you what you request. So let's make sure we understand where Hannah is. She's being tormented because she can't have a child. She feels the love of her husband, but she's also in anguish for not being able to provide him with a child and with a son. She's very faithful in her belief in God, so she does the only thing she knows to do. She goes to the temple and offers a deep prayer, and even in the midst of that, She's attacked by the priest in the temple who thinks that she's drunk. But Hannah holds her ground. And that's an important characteristic of Hannah. She holds her ground. She makes her commitment. And she stands firm in her belief. So I think when Eli notices how committed she is to following this, he then offers a blessing to Hannah. And lo and behold, Hannah gives birth to a son. She names him Shem Uel, which, meaning, which means God has heard, or as is then transposed into the Hebrew, Samuel. So that's her firstborn son, a son by the name of Samuel. Now let's remember what Hannah said in her prayer. She asked God that if God would open up her womb, and give her a son, then she would offer that son back to God so that he could become a servant of God's. Now, some people have looked at that and said, well, that kind of sounds like she's bargaining with God. But bargaining is where you would ask God for something so that you could do something on your own for yourself. That's not what Hannah asks. Hannah simply asks to have a son so that she might commit that son to study in the temple and become a leader of the people, become God's faithful servant.
Let's move to 1 Samuel 1, 26 through 28. And she said to him, pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord there. So Hannah stays true to her commitment to God. After her son is born and after she's finishing, finished weaning her son, she takes him to the temple and she presents him to Samuel. And we see in the biblical passages that Hannah never has a second thought. Now think about that. She's been chastised for years for not being able to have a child. And here God hears her prayer and gives her a child. This is her firstborn and her onlyborn, and yet she's willing to give him to the temple, to the tutelage of Samuel, so that he might become a servant of the Lord. Hannah also includes a prayer or a song, and it's recorded for us in the book of 1 Samuel. Here's one small excerpt. My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord, my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. So Hannah is blessed to have a child, but she's also faithful to her commitment. And not only is she that, but she celebrates with uh, a prayer, exclaiming the rejoicing and how she now has the power over her enemies because she's been delivered by God and how God is holy and God is a rock. As Eli then sends Hannah and Elkanah away from the temple and back to their home in Ephraim, he gives them a blessing that they might have more children. And they did. God blessed them with three more sons and two more daughters. And as for Samuel, he would grow up under the tutelage of Eli, and he would become a very influential prophet and a leader of Israel. Samuel would be asked by God to anoint the first king of Israel, who was Saul. And then when Saul fell out of favor with God, he selected, Samuel that is, selected David from the family of Jesse. Samuel becomes an important character in the history of the Hebrew people and in the history of them moving from being in a position of judges to a position of having a king. So as we've been doing with each one of these uh, characters, we've been talking about their wisdom. So let's look today at the wisdom of Hannah. In many ways, she shared the same dilemma as Sarah and Rachel. She couldn't bear any children. But it was even worse because her husband's other wife would rub salt in the wound because she was barren. Now her husband was sympathetic and her husband tried to treat her with extra benefits but still she was harassed by his other wife. And even in the midst of all of that oppression, she continued to be faithful to God and she continued to lift up her prayers to God. I guess I would ask if we were in a similar situation where individuals were pressuring us, making fun of us, rubbing salt in our wounds because we weren't able to do something, would we, be faithful to continue to ask God to take that situation away from us? Or would we try to fight back with words or actions? Or would we stay true to our faith and look for God to bring us the ultimate solution? That's certainly the wisdom of Hannah. She is willing to wait for God to bring about the solution. And even when she's confronted at first from Eli, who thinks she's drunk, she holds her ground. 
She's steadfast in her willingness and in her prayers to agree that if God blessed her with a son, she would raise him to be a holy man of the faith. And by raising him, it meant that she would give him up to Eli and the temple to be raised in the temple. That's an important part of her character. She's steadfast in her faith. She is immovable. And then when God grants her wish, she doesn't flinch. She doesn't backtrack. She doesn't try to renegotiate. She honors her pledge, even though it meant she would give up her firstborn and at that time, her only child. And through it all, she has nothing but praise for God. And God does bless her in the future with a wonderful family. That ends our Bible study on Hannah, and we're going to look at another individual who is not physically related to Hannah, but shares a common bond with Hannah, and her name is Miriam. She's the sister of Aaron and Moses, and we'll be talking about her next week in our Bible study. Thank you so much for participating in our Bible study. Please have a blessed week, and we will see you next week.